We have strolled with huge steps through the history of communication science, starting in the 6th century before Christ, through antiquity, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and into early modern times. The 19th century is often seen as the starting point of modern times, and characterized by industrialization, the rise of nationalism, birth of political parties, birth of socialism, and subsequent emancipation of the masses. The rise of the media as a social, political, and financial power is closely connected to this. The media were able to influence, make people rich, and form or break communities. Let's briefly go over 19th century thought on this. Well, first of all, we should recognize that despite the power and influence of mass media in former times, all of this increased substantially in the 19th century. Since much more people were able to read and write, the potential audience for print media grew enormously. At the same time, new print technologies and methods for making paper made it easier and cheaper to produce books, pamphlets, magazines and newspapers. Simply put, it became more profitable to cater to the tastes of a mass audience, and therefore literature specifically designed for popular taste was booming. Special magazines for women, books for children, newspapers for members of a political party, pamphlets aiming at villagers in one specific village, it was all becoming part of daily reality. Most noticeably was the transition from pamphlets as the primary print medium for news and debate to newspapers. Although they had existed for a long time, it was only in the 19th century that newspapers started to cater to a popular audience, hence becoming a true mass medium. The new newspaper followed the journalistic format set out by press barons like William Stead, Joseph Pulitzer and Randolph Hearst, in which the news had to be interesting and attention-gaining. New genres like the reportage, cartoon, illustration and later the photo, the column featured article and interview, were quickly adopted throughout the world. Financing of the paper also changed. The old newspaper was often dependent on payment from the government, for which they promised to publish announcements. The new newspaper wanted a large audience since they got their money from sales and advertisement revenue. It was less dependent, and therefore often more critical of, the government, and did its best to entertain, opinionate and inform on all matters, not only political. Crime, agriculture, sports, theatre, music, household appliances, they were now all part of the weekly, and when the appearance rate increased, daily news. Because of these changes, more media, new audience groups and new technologies that made printing easier and cheaper, the media landscape became an economic force to be reckoned with. But also politically, the importance of mass communication increased, and the attitude of politicians changed. In the previous section I explained that scholars started to argue for rulers to be more attentive to public opinion and the power of mass communication. At first the idea behind this was purely pragmatic, but later it was connected to the enlightened and democratic ideal that governments are for the people and therefore should listen to the people. New political theories proposed that the government was in some sense made up of representatives of the people. Mass media were not only a way to influence those people, but also a reflection of public opinion and a check on the misuse of power by the government. It's important to note that scholarly thought had now evolved to the point that all the different channels of mass communication were now collectively labeled as being part of one political institute. In the 19th century, this institute began to be referred to as the Fourth Estate, a term coined by Edmund Burke. Media as the fourth estate, are instrumental for any nation because they function firstly as a channel between government and people, secondly as a barometer of public opinion, and thirdly as a check on the use of power by rulers. The lesson that it paid to listen to your citizens was driven home quite dramatically with the French Revolution in 1789, when the masses rose and executed King Louis XVI and many French nobles. We can only imagine the shock that went through Europe as they set a dangerous precedent. We'll not go into the historical ramifications of the French Revolution, but it's enough to note that the subsequent 19th century saw many concessions towards democratic ideals in most European countries. The attitude towards mass communication changed as well. The idea grew that media had a political power to be either feared or harnessed. 
Before the 19th century, legislation in many countries had been aimed at controlling the media landscape, punishing authors that criticized the government, banning pamphlets, books or newspapers that were deemed politically or religiously subversive. However, these measures proved unsuccessful, as forbidden fruit tastes the sweetest, and authors were able to move and get their work printed in other countries relatively easy. Dutch Republic, for example, was for many a place where basically everything could be published, as long as you kept friendly towards the city's government, of course. In the 19th century, most countries changed their stance towards media governance. They actually adopted the fourth estate principle in their legislation when they explicitly promised freedom of the press in their constitutions. Journalists at the same time gained higher status, receiving, for instance, special clearance to be at government meetings. Politicians started to make more and more use of the powers of the fourth estate instead of trying to suppress it. Political campaigns were now becoming media scripted events. Important politicians also had close ties with newspapers, often as editor-in-chief or financial backer. At the end of the 19th century, the mass media were widely acknowledged as an economically, politically and socially powerful institute. Scholarly thought now recognized mass communication as an integral part of our society. The stage was set for the further development of scientific thought on communication in the 20th century. We'll talk about that topic next week. I hope to see you then.